have a group of people that can think compassion, think peace, think um, uh, goodwill, and demonstrate it, and be able to maintain that state of being where they've memorized it internally, nothing in their external world can move them from it. When they're in a state of being, they're more prone to do things and think things equal to that state of being. Welcome, blessed viewers, to this week's edition of Science and Spirituality, the conclusion of a two-part series featuring excerpts of interviews with respected scientists regarding how our brain is connected to spirituality and self-transformation. The brain contains a massive and complex neural network with approximately 100 billion nerve cells. It monitors and regulates key body functions such as breathing and heart rate, receives sensory information, manages physical motion like walking and talking, and is involved in reasoning and dreaming. The major parts of the brain are the hindbrain, which has the cerebellum and brainstem, the midbrain, and the forebrain, which has the diencephalon and the cerebrum. During much of the modern era, mainstream science has avoided focusing on spirituality in neurological research. However, in recent years, there have been an increasing number of studies regarding how the human brain functions and reacts during meditation, prayer, near-death experiences, and when one is engaged in focused, constructive thinking. Newberg, the person who did the studies of the Buddhist monks and meditators, got qualitative descriptors of what these people felt like during their most advanced stage, stages of meditation. And they said, I feel unconditionally loved. I do not feel a sense of the self. I feel like I am totally connected to the universe. So I would say that is kind of like the overall spiritual transcendence. And if you think of what the term transcendent means, it means to go beyond the self, which really fits with the neuropsychological studies. It has been well documented that regular meditation changes the way the brain functions. Thanks to the development of state-of-the-art tools, neuroscientists now better understand the role of the brain. Some of the many instruments they use include RCBF, or regional cerebral blood flow, real-time MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging, MEG, or magnetoencephalography, and improved EEG, or electroencephalography. In the study, they did these spec scans with Buddhist meditators and Franciscan nuns. And that shows what parts of the brain get blood flow. And when these Buddhist monks kind of were at their most heightened state of awareness, they pushed a button, they took a picture of the blood flow of the brain. And same with the nuns. And what happened, parts of the frontal lobe became very active, parts of the parietal lobe became very active, and then the right parietal lobe shut down. Mm -hmm. So it got less blood flow. Meditation is the process of knowing yourself, understanding who you are, and because we have such a large frontal lobe, we can observe our own thoughts, and our own actions, and our own behaviors, and that concept in neuroscience is called metacognition. Uh, a number of brain imaging studies showing that, uh, for instance, uh, patients suffering from uh, clinical depression uh, or obsessive-compulsive disorder, when they start meditating, and doing what we call metacognition, which is uh, to take a distance from your own thoughts, your own beliefs, your own emotions, then it's possible to change the functioning of the brain. The benefits of meditation are immense. Scientific studies have shown that practicing meditation leads to lowering of heart rate, chronic pain alleviation, and erasing of negative thinking. A recent study found that long-time practitioners have significantly larger volumes of the right hippocampus and increased gray matter in the right thalamus, left interior temporal gyrus, and right orbitofrontal cortex, as compared to the rest of the population. Interestingly, all of these regions are associated with control of one's emotions, and researchers feel that this may be an explanation for the emotional stability seen in those who meditate. So, 
The process of meditation requires unlearning and relearning, or what neuroscience calls pruning synaptic connections and sprouting new connections. Because we can do that, that allows us to modify and change our behavior so that we can do a better job in life. You really can't change uh, the way uh, certain brain structures function and brain networks underlying all sorts of negative emotional states. While our daily thoughts may seem to be inconsequential, this is far from the case. Our thinking literally has the power to change our genes. You have genetically inherited patterns of brain activity. There is no question about that. That mm -hmm. is completely not controversial. But your genetically inherited patterns of brain activity are going to have very, very large effects on how you live your life. However, mm -hmm. if you realize that you can transcend, you can go beyond those patterns of brain activity through the power of your attention and through focusing your attention more wisely, you can mm -hmm. change the expression of those genes. When science and spirituality returns, we will continue to examine the brain's role in spirituality and affecting self-transformation. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television. that everything we're saying here about how focused attention changes your brain is very compatible with mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. you're basically forming a view of the self you are through prayer mm -hmm. and meditation coming to see that God wants you to be. Welcome back to Science and Spirituality featuring distinguished scientists speaking about how the brain is interrelated with spirituality and can be remapped to significantly change our physical and mental state. Some habits are deeply ingrained and imprinted in our brains and thus become even more entrenched as we grow older. If we do not focus our attention or deeply concentrate on changing an unwanted trait that we have, Scientists such as Dr. Bruce Lipton, who is an expert in cell biology, say these habits stay with us permanently. From before birth to two years of age, a child will express predominantly delta activity, which is very low frequency brain activity. When we express that, we're essentially sleeping or not being conscious, okay? And it doesn't mean a child's unconscious, like knocked out. The child is totally present, but not engaged in what's going on. It's seeing it, observing it, and downloading it, but doesn't like interfere with the download, doesn't say, gee, that was a good behavior, that was bad behavior. It just watches you and learns the behavior. It's not being consciously involved in the learning. Subconsciousness is not consciousness. Consciousness is creative. Subconsciousness are tapes. Where did you get the tapes? Huh. Your subconscious was programmed before birth up through six years of age without you even being involved. You learn tapes about how to live. After you get past six, this development of the prefrontal cortex region here, which is where our central source of consciousness comes from, self-consciousness, self-reflection, is an add-on, really. And as a matter of fact, it's an option. A lot of people in this world don't even use consciousness. The reason is you don't need it. Once you learn the program, it's just repetition. When you are not paying attention to your own consciousness, you are playing tapes that are not even yours. And you don't even see it because the subconsciousness works imperceptibly. It's so fast that it doesn't even engage consciousness. You see, every time we have a thought, we make a chemical. So if we have a great thought or if we have an unlimited thought, we make chemicals that make us feel great or feel unlimited. And if we have negative thoughts or self-depreciating thoughts, we make chemicals that make us feel negative or unworthy. So this immaterial thing called thought fires a set of circuits in the brain that produces a chemical to signal the body for us to feel exactly the way we were just thinking. The moment we feel the way we think, we begin to think the way we feel which produces more chemicals for us to think the this way we feel. This creates a big loop. And this loop, the, this cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking creates what I call a state of being. And 
it's the cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking over time that begins to condition the body to memorize that emotional state better than the conscious mind. The power of thought can affect the brain to such a degree that if one's thoughts are continually not on a constructive level, it and the entire bodily system can be affected in a very negative way. By contrast, if our thoughts and attitude are positive, our brain reacts differently and our body is healthier and outlook on life is sunnier. We live in two states of mind. We live in survival or creation and when we live in those states uh, of anger or aggression or hatred or judgment or fear or anxiety or insecurity or pain or suffering um, or depression, it's those chemicals that are created from the chemicals of stress or survival that activate those states of mind and the redundancy of those chemicals are the chemicals that push the genetic buttons that begin to cause disease. If your thinking and feeling has been negative for the last 20 years, your mind may be thinking positively, but your body is remembering mm. being negative. 90% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is sitting in a subconscious set of programs, automatic programs that operate without our conscious mind. And so here's the 10% of your conscious mind wanting to change against 90% of, of who we've become as a personality. So we have to learn how to get into the operating system. It takes going past the analytical mind to be able to do that, and that takes practice. Our sincere gratitude goes to the notable scientists featured today for sharing their insights on the brain, mind, and consciousness. We wish all of them success in their further study of the brain and how self-transformation and spiritual experience are related to this fantastic organ. For more information on the scientists on today's program, please visit the following websites. Dr. Mario Beauregard, mappageweb.umontreal.ca forward slash Beauregard M. Dr. Joe Dispenza, www.drjoedispenza.com. Dr. Brick Johnstone, www.telerehab.net forward slash johnston.htm Dr. Bruce Lipton www.brucelipton.com Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz www.jeffreymschwartz.com Thank you, intelligent viewers, for your company on today's episode of Science and Spirituality. Coming up next is Words of Wisdom after Noteworthy News, here on Supreme Master Television. May our planet always be united by love and grace. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash ss.